my, my brief intro fun PyTorch story is like less than a year ago when I decided I wanted to do uh, machine learning, the first thing I did was uh, go to the open PyTorch issues with like very little like ML background. So to me as like an outsider from ML, uh, PyTorch was like synonymous with machine learning. So cool, uh, cool to be here, really fun. Um, Anyway, my name's Will. I work at Hugging Face. Um, I work on diffusers, and this, this talk is going to be uh, about uh, diff uh, PyTorch 2.0 and diffusers. Um, so background on diffusers, because not everyone knows about it. Um, Transformers is like our big library. Diffusers is like the, the, the little brother library. Uh, fun fact is we have like just as many uh, interactions on GitHub, but less people working on it because we have less users. So fun and stressful, but like really cool. Um, the main discrepancy with models you'll find in transformers is that uh, inference is an incremental denoising process where we're predicting the whole target sequence, which is frequently images at a time. Um, comparing that to the incremental inference procedures you see in transformers is generally autoregressive. Um, standard caveat there is that, like, of course, you can use transformer models to predict or non-diffusion non models predict whole target sequences at a time. Mainly, it's just a separate library for like branding, in my opinion, but it works. Um, the mathematical way to say that is that we model the joint distribution of a set of latent variables and a target variable, if anyone's interested in that stuff. Um, cool. Uh, the backstory behind this talk is we did a blog post with diffusers on, um, with, uh, on PyTorch 2.0 with diffusers, uh, we being the other members of my team, I didn't actually write it. Um, this is a great blog post. It's like very, uh, it's like lots of multi-dimensional uh, measurements about like different GPUs, different things you can enable in PyTorch 2.0 if you're doing like production applications and kind of want like a feeling for um, what you should expect in terms of inference speeds and whatnot. Definitely like a really good place to start. Um, this talks more kind of like a, a micro view because like if you want to read the blog, go read the blog. It's really good. Um, cool. PyTorch 2.0, what do we care about um, in diffusers? One is uh, torch.compile, and the other one is fast uh, transformers. Really, it's fast attention blocks. I just needed a cool cool picture to use. Um, the TLDR of this talk is, um, this is kind of what like your inference code looks like if you're using uh, diffusers as an API for inference, um, that you only need a four-line diff if you want to enable uh, the Torch 2.0 features. Um, really, it's a two-line diff because we'll do the uh, attention processor bit for you if we detect that that's what you have installed. Um, the attention processor thing, uh, just the TLDR is like we have a few different like uh, implementations of attention blocks that you might need to use in diffusers, and that's just like the API we expose for it. Examples of that might be like if you're doing pre-training or if you're doing training with like LoRa blocks or something that's like a technical different attention processor. Um, you still have to opt into torch.compile, obviously. We don't do that for you um, if you want to. Uh, this talk is only going to be on this line. I wanted to do some stuff on torch.compile, but I didn't have enough time to like look into it that much. We're just going to look at what the new uh, attention mechanisms are in torch 2.0. Uh, so, okay, so this is a starting point. Um, this is called a UNet. This is the backbone of diffusion models. It's a standard uh, down, it's a standard my notes here did not do the bullet points, so this is going to be hard to read. Um, this is the common backbone of diffusion networks. It's a bottleneck network. You usually see things like this in autoencoders. Um, it's a set of downsampling convolutions followed by like, a mirrored set of upsampling convolu uh, convolutions, and you have residual connections from the downsample side to the upsample side. Um, the other additional thing that's not shown here and is generally not shown on most of the UNet images online is there's also, uh, you have transformer decoder blocks kind of intermixed in here. Um, all those uh, transformer decoder blocks are the things that have the cross attention on text embeddings. So when you use things like stable diffusion, you have like a little text prompt that's like, give me an astronaut on the moon. Um, that's how these models incorporate them. They do uh, uh, cross attention on the intermediate feature maps of the images and then frozen text embeddings. Uh, the encoder is, of course, obviously always pre-trained. We don't really use custom ones for any of these models. Um, there's no inherent reason you have to use these. Um, you can also use transformers. Um, in fact, we have transformer diffusion models uh, in diffusers as well. Um, image modeling is just sequence to sequence. So this is just a decent fit for it. Cool. Um, so units, step one. Uh, step two. Uh, where are units expensive? These are a set of um, rough rough benchmarks I took using NVIDIA System Profiler on um, on our unit. Uh, caveat is after I did this, I forgot to uh, do it cross batch sizes. So let's pretend a batch size of one is representative. 
Um, I'm not, I hope the font's big enough here, but if you can't see it, basically, um, the single kernel that takes the most time here is the bash detention kernel. Um, it's not taking more than 50% of the time, it's like 20 to 40%, but of the kernels, it's the single most expensive one. Um, also caveat is sometimes it's hard to figure out what, what uh, actual kernels being ran from these things, because sometimes, especially when you compile kernels, you get these really funky names for them. Okay, attention blocks, they occur in units. They're also expensive. Step three, what are attention blocks? Um, this is the canonical attention equation, obviously. We've kind of like evangelized it, but it's not that complicated. Um, let's uh, think about this from the perspective of just self-attention. All we're doing is we're taking an input sequence and then we're performing an inner product of it on itself. And then we're using that to compute kind of a weighted average of the sequence itself again. Um, the only thing that's really important here is that the expensive part is the uh, memory costs of that inner product of the thing with itself and then writing that thing back out to memory. Um, and what I really like about the algorithm uh, here, it's from one of the one of the um, later slides, it's from a paper in one of the later slides, is just it shows explicitly like where things are written to memory. Um, so that S matrix and that P matrix, those are both um, N squared writes to, uh, writes to memory where N is the size of the input sequence. The TLDR there is those are expensive memory writes. Um, and in the naive implementation, um, those can all be launched as separate, those might all be launched as separate kernels, or if we're doing like backprop, we also have to save those intermediate values for the reverse pass. Okay, so now we know why approximately attention is expensive. Um, this is kind of just a dump of all the attention, attention, um, attention blocks in the stable diffusion 1.5 unit. Um, I think I forgot to mention earlier, this is all stable diffusion 1.5, um, along with approximate flop counts. Um, and so basically, like, as we move down the unit, like we said before, um, the channels of the actual input image uh, increase, but the uh, resolution of it decreases. The resolution is the thing that de determines the sequence length of those attention blocks. Um, uh, and then so the uh, naive memory costs of it are O of the sequence like squared. And so that sequence length is a thing that's decreasing, which means the uh, most expensive attention blocks of your uh, unit are going to be the ones at the beginning when you have the longest sequence length and at the very end of it on the other side, which is when you're back to the original sequence length. Cool. Um, the TLDR of then how to make it faster is like, you can just have like really smart kernel implementations that avoid materializing those uh, O of N squared uh, matrices. Um, and PyTorch uh, 2.0 is the thing that makes these uh, natively available for you. Um, so PyTorch has, uh, through the scale dot product detention uh, API, has three different kernel implementations. Um, flash attention, memory efficient attention, and then a PyTorch uh, C++ one, which is usually referred to as math in the docs, uh, just because like if you're doing, um, due to like, uh, especially if you're doing like math things where you want to make sure your outputs are consistent, that's the thing that will give you the most consistent uh, or might be always consistent floating point arithmetic. Okay, uh, we know what PyTorch gives us. Now we're going to talk about like why it's better. Um, side note is I'm 99% sure this is the uh, memory efficient attention one that's in the docs. I just couldn't find an explicit link to it, but I'm like pretty darn confident this is the, the right one. Um, anyway, so like if you look back at the attention equation, um, the important thing to see of it, it's really just a weighted average over the, va the vectors in the value matrix. It's not that much more complicated than that. Um, and that the numerator weighting and the denominator normalization are the things that come from the soft max. Um, and if you just look at the like standard like high school algebra, if you're doing like a weighted average, uh, the algebra means we don't have to do it like in the way that the attention equation tells us to do it. We can just like rearrange it. Um, it's called the like, they call it like lazy soft max where basically uh, we compute the numerator uh, immediately on the fly and then we compute the denominator on the fly and then at the end, once we have those, we just take the, take the fraction of them instead of in the equation where we would do the matrix, materialize it, take the soft max and then do the weighted average after. Um, so as a result, we don't need to write the intermediate sequence length squared matrices to DRAM. Um, and then if we need them in back propagation, we can recompute them with selective uh, gradient checkpointing. Um, so it's mentioned a bit in the papers. It's not super clear to me, but basically like we can also like save parts of those intermediate uh, statistics from the softmax to avoid recomputing the whole thing. Um, but anyway, what's interesting about this too is uh, it's more flops, but when including the recomputation, but it's actually faster wall clock time, which is like a really, really kind of cool little tidbit there. 
Um, next is uh, flash attention. It's effectively the, uh, it's the same thing, but the method of tiling and the softmax statist uh, statistic summarization is slightly different. Um, the TLDR, as far as I understand, is just, it's fewer memory accesses. Um, I actually don't entirely understand it, so that's the section in the paper if you want to uh, investigate it. One other thing that I forgot to mention here is that um, do you, there, there's, a, there, there's one other caveat here, which is um, this, the, this is not the, the actual exact formula you use. There's um, uh, numerical stability things. If you're doing a softmax, you, like, uh, you subtract the maximum of like, the inputs of the, of the numerator because you're taking exponents, but that's not super important for this talk. Anyway, um, this is a rough performance analysis of the different attention blocks. And as we said earlier, the uh, ones at the beginning, uh, the ones of the longest sequence length, they're going to be the most expensive. Um, and note that flash attention is not always available depending on the attention dimensions and the floating point data types that you use. I don't think it's available for 32-bit floating point in PyTorch. Um, and then so anyway, that what's interesting here is the choice is nuanced, but um, PyTorch always chooses for you. This is me forcing the, um, the, there's an API to choose which attention implementation it's going to use. Um, there's, I don't think it's explicitly documented anywhere what the actual uh, logic for which attention block is chosen. Um, it's in the SDP utils header though. I didn't really read it entirely. If you want to look at it, you can, you can look at it. It's uh, more. Um, this is the simplified benchmarking code. This was, uh, PyTorch is awesome. It took me like 20 minutes to write this. PyTorch is like a really good library. I can't, can't get enough of it. Um, anyway, in summary, um, PyTorch and diffusers, in my opinion, is a super good uh, example of why uh, the open source ecosystem is so great. Um, everyone gets to build on top of each other. Um, that was like a lot of really like complicated math, but like PyTorch does a lot of work implementing that. And it's like a single uh, function call is the API that they give us. Um, diffusers then, we get to look at our code and figure out where in like our architecture we have that um, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, performance bottleneck is. And then we expose another abstraction to our users when in the case, which in the case of uh, attention is, we show two lines here, but really we do this for you automatically. Um, end user gets a four line code diff and then everyone's happy and everyone gets to make images faster with diffusers. Um, anyway, uh, th this is the, the, the blog post we did. It's much more kind of macro and it looks at like cross different GPU model types and more kind of what in production uh, effects you would expect to get when upgrading diffusers to PyTorch 2.0. We also compare versus like Xformers, which is where you would originally get these optimized attention blocks. Um, really good blog post, doing anything in production, that's probably where you should go. Uh, that's, that's where you can find us on the internet. Uh, that are Hugging Face website and Diffusers, plus we have a bunch of other open source stuff, which is probably more frequently known than Diffusers. Thank you. Um, but how, how so? Like, how do you want to just, yeah, yeah. But like, how, how are you, you don't need to distribute the workload for like a single, single thing. Like you want to batch distribute across them. Yeah. You, you could, you could batch distribute it across them. I don't think you would need to do anything in the library itself though. Uh, like, right. You you could do that and you use our API and then you could, uh, instance, basically we have these things called pipelines and you could instantiate one to one of your GPUs and the other one you could instantiate to the other one and then feed them in separately. We have like a lot of people who like open like GitHub questions or like, how do I use this for like what thing and what production? And I'm like, we don't handle that. We just straight like model definitions, inference code, uh, our training stuff is sometimes where we get into more nuances of what, um, what sort of like 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 a uh, machine stuff we run on, yeah. Accelerate's a accelerate's a good library. Sometimes it's hard to figure out how to use it, but yeah. yeah. Any other? Cool. Thank you for thank you for listening to me.
That's better. Yeah? Okay. Um, so if there's Q&A at the end, um, just because it's a little hard to hear folks in the front, I'll run up and give you the mic so everybody can hear. Hi. I'm Ashok Imani. I work in the PyTorch team at Intel. I will be walking, walking through a few uh, PyTorch optimizations from Intel, uh, Intel extension for PyTorch, and uh, some of our efforts in uh, upstream uh, PyTorch community projects. OK, here is a big picture of how uh, different layers fit together. At the bottom layer, we have highly optimized performance libraries uh, for deep learning and distributed training, 1DNN and 1CCL. Uh, these libraries work with all the Intel platforms, including CPU and GPUs. So we try to uh, upstream these optimizations to frameworks such as PyTorch, and also Intel extension for PyTorch. Uh, and then we make sure these optimizations are enabled in uh, ecosystem projects. Usually, most of these optimizations get picked up by default uh, in the, you know, by the ecosystem projects. But sometimes we may have to, uh, f based on some specific use cases, we have to enable and fine tune using our Intel extension for PyTorch or in general, optimizations for specific uh, use cases. I will be going through some of these optimizations, such as Hugging Face, uh, TorchServe, PyG, and uh, you know Deep Speed. Okay. Here is a you know some of the milestones from Intel point of view for uh, PyTorch upstream. Uh, we have had one DNN default since 2018. Uh, what that means is users and users get the best performance out of the box uh, in eager mode. Uh, and we have since then enabled the block layout, which required us to convert the tensors into a block layout format. Um, with the channel last support later, we do not have to do that anymore. And then we enabled training and DLRM optimizations, uh, added autom expression with bfloat16, support for XPU device. That means we can plug in Intel GPUs, for example. And more recently in uh, 1.13, we added uh, the channel last layout, which I mentioned you do not have to uh, deal with the block layouts anymore. Uh, we enabled 1DNN fusions in the tort script JIT mode. And we also enabled 1DNN quant backend. Uh, this feature, the quantization backend, uh, has recently been uh, promoted as a unified default x86 backend for quantization in 2.0. And in 2.0, we work closely with the inductor CPU team, inductor team to enable CPU optimizations uh, with the 1DNN fusions. We also uh, added support for graph neural networks and uh, 1DNN graph integration. I will go through some of these features in the next few slides. So 2.0 is a game changer in the sense that the Dynamo uh, basically allows us to expand our model coverage, unlike the Todd script where we were limited by some of the limitations uh, to support the graph mode for all the models. With Dynamo, the model coverage is much more improved. And we worked with the inductor and Dynamo core team to enable 1DNN fusions uh, you know, default, right? So with torch.compile, uh, we have F32 inference on CPU working now. And as you can see, we have started working since October 2022 and, you know, continues, continue to add new optimizations. Uh, uh, right now, I, you know, 1.8x performance with multi-thread and single thread 1.44x. And this is across different uh, benchmarks, uh, Torchbench, Hugging Face, and the team models from Hugging Face for Vision. Uh, we plan to continue to add more optimizations, uh, Bfloat 16 and training optimizations. Uh, so you can expect that in 
So the extension for PyTorch, uh, you can think of it as a staging ground. So we add the latest features and experimental features and uh, support for new platform features here. And eventually, they will be upstream to PyTorch. Uh, it also has ease of use Python API. Uh, that means sometimes users just have to, with a single line of code, they can enable most of these optimizations. Uh, and we have some examples. I will go through them. And uh, you know, if you look at the the chart, uh, the the picture here, we added optimizations in every layer uh, at the eight and ops level, the graph level, uh, custom operators, custom optimizers, and also uh, the one API stack for GPU is also enabled. Okay. And finally, we have the support for Python and C++-based deployment. So users can deploy directly with C++ uh, or usually through Python, uh, the usual way. So you know, if you look at the big picture for the optimization techniques, you can think of it as uh, three buckets, uh, operators, graph, and runtime. In the operator section, we have uh, the, you know, think of it as A10 operator optimizations. It has the a AMP auto mix pression, layout optimizations, support for vectorization, parallelization at the operator level. And then at the graph mode, we have uh, the support for Torch script in the previous uh, 1.x uh, graph mode. Uh, since 2.0, we have support for Dynamo and Inductor. And uh, we, through IPEX, as I mentioned, with a simple IPEX.optimize, you can actually trigger most of these optimizations with a single uh, line of code change. And uh, runtime, it's primarily for uh, making sure you're during a deployment and for even benchmarking, I guess, you can make sure OpenMP and uh, the threading runtime is heavily optimized and tuned, um, such as pinning or affinity and so on. And we also provide a launcher which allows you to, which simplifies this uh, process. We also have a weight sharing if you want to do multi-streams multi in the same uh, process, for example. I will, I, I, we have some examples I will walk through. So quickly to walk through a few uh, optimizations. Just... So this is an example of how you can enable autocast, for example. This is the typical use case uh, in PyTorch. There is nothing special here. Uh, just the highlighted code with autocast. So that should trigger the autom expression and autocast feature for you. With For channel last, uh, unlike the block layout where users have to insert two dense or two layout conversions, uh, with channel last, we can provide the same performance as block layout, but users do not have to uh, insert the block layout conversions. So this is uh, helps us achieve equal performance and more model coverage. So you can enable this feature uh, using the memory format uh, channel last. With, uh, with IPEX, it's much simpler. Uh, these optimizations are automatically enabled for you uh, with a just single line of code, IPEX.optimize. Okay, so I think I had CC enabled. Um, so the quantization uh, is a typical flow. This is uh, usually in upstream PyTorch. You have a prepared step and then a calibration step for uh, static quantization and uh, for dynamic quantization. It's, it's you don't have to do anything, and then you usually convert. Uh, this is uh, this is the standard upstream PyTorch way of quantization. With uh, IPEX, uh, the flow is similar, but we actually also integrated our neural compressor uh, 
Intel Neural Compressor, our low pressure uh, library, so through auto tune feature. So you can, uh, the option three I mentioned here uh, will enable that. And we also have the prepare, convert, and auto tune uh, available through IPEX. So you can import that and just enable these three steps. So you can benefit from the auto tune from Intel Neural Compressor. Uh, for the graph mode, we have uh, the 1.x dot script optimizations. Uh, you can enable that through the usual way where you either jtrace and freeze or uh, the dot script uh, method. Uh, you can also optionally enable the 1DN graph extension. And in 2.0, you just have to do torch.compile, as you know. And the graph mode in IPEX is, again, simpler. You just have to call the IPEX.optimize, graph mode equals true, and that will take care of it. And uh, finally, the runtime. Um, as I mentioned, runtime uh, has few features. Uh, one of them is launcher and uh, memory buffer fooling, where you can uh, launch multi-streams and do weight sharing, and uh, also uh, because it's IPEX launcher, we can actually, without any code change, we can enable IPEX optimizations. And here is an example how you can uh, use the launcher to automatically enable the optimizations for bfloat 16 uh, BERT inference. And you can apply this for other models as well. And uh, here is an example for the multi-stream that I just mentioned. Um, Okay, so the 1DN graph uh, extension uh, was recently added to 1DNN, so it's a graph extension in 1DNN, and we have enabled this in uh, 2.0. Uh, it's primarily targets the subgraph fusion patterns for compute intensive ops and neighboring ops, so it's a little bit uh, tries to move, do more aggressive fusions uh, than the ones that are available in the existing uh, TOT script path. And uh, this, as I mentioned, this is a, a you know a beta feature in 2.0 uh, with support for F32 and uh, bfloat 16 inference. Um, the usage of this is uh, simpler. Uh, it, it, it has a simple and easy to use interface. So you just have to enable this uh, JIT dot enable as I showed in the previous code snippet. And uh, you can learn more about this uh, at the link here. Um, it has, as I mentioned, uh, aggressive fusion patterns, so you you can expect to see uh, more generally uh, more performance across different models. So, in 2.0, we also added uh, optimizations for graph neural networks uh, to both 2.0 PyTorch 2.0 and also to PyG. In in 2.0, we added uh, support for uh, sparse matrix multiplication, uh, scatter reduce, and gather. So these are for the enabling the GNN models. And uh, the performance, if you see, this is uh, the standard benchmark uh, for the PyG. We can see up to 4x performance improvements. Uh, in PyG, we added uh, index sort and also uh, affinity mixin. So that helps performance in PyG as well. So you have optimizations both in uh, 2.0 PyTorch and uh, PyG as well. So this is for uh, GNNs. We work closely with uh, Hugging Face to make sure uh, all of the optimizations that I just discussed are properly enabled. Um, most of the optimizations in PyTorch, upstream PyTorch, just get picked up automatically, uh, but we have work closely with Hugging Face to enable Intel extension for PyTorch and uh, the Intel Neural Compressor that I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, as an example for stable diffusion, you can, for example, uh, use a few short fine tuning uh, for your own custom data set uh, using 4S Sapphire Rapid Nodes uh, in, in under five minutes, you can do that. And then use the same Sapphire Rapids to do inference uh, you know, with under five seconds on the same chip. 
and we have a, a live demo for this on the Intel Dev Cloud and AWS at the links uh, shared there. Okay, so we also work closely with the TorchServe team at uh, Meta and uh, other, other TorchServe uh, contributors. And we have enabled Intel extension for PyTorch, the Intel uh, the launcher from IPEX, the, and also upstream PyTorch optimizations get picked up. And again, enabling this in TorchServe is a single line code, of ch code change, uh, IPEX underscore enable equals true. And for uh, launcher, similarly, you can enable that uh, in the config.properties for TorchServe. Um, we did benchmarking on a couple of models for Torch on the Torch Vision side and the NLP side, and we see uh, 7.7x performance and 2.2x. And you should expect to see uh, similar performance improvements uh, across wide set of models in the TorchServe uh, repository. So uh, we also enabled uh, optimizations to deep speed. Uh, the optimizations were enabled through a device-independent abstraction. Uh, so we have the CPU op builders uh, implementation and also the accelerator implementation. Uh, this is for the CPU side. And for the GPU side, we have uh, Intel extension for deep speed, which enables similar abstractions. So you have the sickle op builders and uh, XPU kernels. Uh, because this is a device-independent abstraction, you can expect to see uh, the performance gains in your deep speed. So the integration and optimizations that we discussed uh, earlier should carry over uh, to, through, these, uh, through this abstraction. And uh, I have an URL there. If, you, if you're interested, uh, please check it out. And finally, uh, a GPU support, uh, as I mentioned in previously, we have the full GPU support in, uh, for Intel GPUs. Uh, the interface is uh, through standard API. Um, you know, we have this concept of XPU device, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, the backend kernels are implemented using the one API uh, stack uh, programming model. Uh, this is uh, released through, together in the same Intel extension for PyTorch. So if you go to the Intel extension for PyTorch uh, GitHub repository, it should support both CPU and GPU uh, starting on 1.13 release. A few links here. And um, and resources. I think that's all I had. I will leave the links there. If you have any questions, I can take. Sure, go ahead. Hang on, real quick. Sorry, um, I was uh, I was very interested in the stable diffusion example that you showed, um, with the five minutes for fine tuning and uh, or, or, and five minutes for uh, five seconds for inference. Um, what kind of uh, so, so you said a few images for um, fine tuning it? Can you give an example of the kind of stuff that you could do? Um, this is more I know stable diffusion specific, but just one. So we used this uh, some custom data uh, example data set. I think Doco or some images. Uh, they applied this personalized fine tuning just on the few images. I think maybe even one. I think uh, so. We the main uh, takeaway I wanted to provide is we make sure all the optimizations such as bfloat 16 and uh, for inference side intake using our uh, neural compressor. We after you enable them, uh, you can shorten the time it takes to do your own custom fine tuning using few short fine tuning technique. Just in five minutes, you can do your own stable diffusion on CPUs without having to use GPUs, right? And then you can do the inference on the same CPU uh, under five seconds as well, right? So 
we have a, an article and uh, details, and, and I also provided a live demo, so you don't have to you know, build your own pipeline and so on. You can try it out uh, on the Hugging Face as well as, I believe, AWS uh, links. I, I, so I think I missed that link because I, I went to that link. It's not online. Maybe I missed the link. It was the wrong link that I got it. I can Could you possibly uh, show it. Yeah. yeah. Let me follow up offline. I can show the link here, but I will make sure you can access it. Yeah. We also have, I think, a tutorial and a medium blog post, and uh, you know, that goes into detail how you can. Uh, bring in your own custom data, data set or, and do this. Yeah. Very exciting. Thanks. Hey, any other questions for Ashak? Yep. I have a question for on device. Um, so an, old, an older on device deployment story would be um, an Onyx runtime with an EP of OpenVINO. Given what you've shown here for a desktop, what would be the new story for the most optimized on device? So, Onyx runtime, you know, I guess that you can use that as a runtime deployment, right? Uh, PyTorch is more for not just for deployment, but to do your own uh, model development and. Uh, no, I understand that. I'm, I'm saying. If, if you were deploying, say, an Onyx model on a Windows device, you would use the OpenVINO EP to mm -hmm. get really good performance. Is anything you're showing here replace that on device, or are we all talking about cloud and inference and training? Right, no, no, it doesn't replace. It's uh, OpenVINO, you can still use that with uh, Onyx backend, as a backend runtime deployment, right? It gives the best performance for uh, different use cases. Uh, this is more like a complementary option for you if you want to deploy on, even on Windows, right? But uh, most of the talk is on Xeon and Linux and GPUs, right? But for Windows, uh, we do have the PyTorch upstream. You can install PyTorch, for example, on your Windows device and run it. But it's more like a complementary, right? It's not a replacement. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.